All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, there's not, still some people coming in, but I'll go ahead and, and start. Um, uh, my name is Nicole Caban. I'm a VISTA with the Florida Literacy Coalition, and we're hosting today's webinar. Um, if you'll take a look at your control panel, you'll see um, a questions box. If you have any questions, you may type them there. Also, if you look at the left side of your control panel, you'll see a hand icon. This is a hand raise feature. So if you are prompted to answer a question by raising your hand, um, you can click that. Um, so we are happy to welcome back um, Jamie Adelson Goldstein, who will be presenting today. Jamie uh, began her ESOL career uh, preparing UAE helicopter pilots for flight school in the US. She spent 25 years as a classroom teacher coordinator and teacher advisor in the adult division of the Los Angeles Unified School District while giving ESOL workshops and teaching adult ESL methods um, for the UCLA extension. In 2006, Jamie turned her focus exclusively to curriculum development and teacher education for ESOL. Um, over the last nine years, she's given seminars, workshops, and webinars in the US and overseas, and has worked on a variety of curriculum projects for California, Florida, and Singapore. Jamie currently teaches adult uh, methods course for TSOL, is working on CRR, CCR standards training for the California Literacy Professional Development Project, and is developing the third edition of the Oxford Picture Dictionary. Um, so thank you for joining us today, Jamie, and I will go ahead and hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Nicole, and welcome, everyone. I'm going to do my very best not to have coughing jags, but if I do, Nicole has taught me how to mute so I don't uh, abuse your ears. And now that you know a bit about me, I thought it would be great for me to find out a little bit about you. Nicole, I think I need the control. Yes. Give me the power. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, in asking, you know, in these types of situations, we just don't have the same connection that we have face to face, but I'm hoping that I can at least follow good pedagogy in getting a little sense of your needs. So I'm going to be asking you uh, two sets of questions, one that's specifically about you and your teaching context, and one about your learners and their level of proficiency. So the first poll is going to be asking you, about uh, your teaching context. So, Nicole, would you put that up? Yes. And are they able to click on more than one item? Um, only one, unfortunately. OK, so forced choice. Pick the one that you most want to be known by. Do you tutor one or more learners? Do you teach a class of learners? Do you coordinate a program? Are you equally important but just not mentioned on this list? And it looks like we have uh, not quite a split, almost a split of teachers, uh, uh, classroom teachers and tutors, a uh, little heavier on the tutor side. And then if we could go to the second poll. And now I'm asking you, what level of language proficiency are your learners? Let's see how that's shaping up. So I would like to speak to the beginning literacy teachers and make you aware that a lot of the information in this webinar in particular is geared towards a higher level of proficiency. However, I think knowing where your learners are going and maybe some of the scaffolding techniques that we'll talk about are very important. And you'll notice that when we talk about the college and career readiness standards for writing, that there is an area devoted to the beginning literacy, beginning level. So this gives us a picture. And it looks like we're focused in pretty much in the area that we were, were aiming towards. But as I say, for beginning literacy and beginning ESOL, you're going to come up with ideas. But the writing you're going to see as examples, and it's 
not student writing at this point, but what you're going to see is going to be higher than what your learners would be expected to produce. But I think this, the, the uh, concepts will be very appropriate. So a moment of reflection. How do you personally feel about writing? I think it's worth just considering that for a moment because very much, you know, it, we, we have a great effect on how our learners feel. And if we are enthusiastic about something, we can actually draw that enthusiasm out of our learners to some degree. So, you know, if you are someone who doesn't really enjoy writing, then you may not be including it in your in your uh, lesson as much lessons as much. And then, oh, Nicole, I think I need control back. It looks like. There we go. Maybe. Hmm. It doesn't seem to be advancing for me. It's always an adventure, isn't it? This is really giving you a lot of time to reflect on how you feel about writing. At this point, you're probably like the gentleman in the middle. <laughs> there we go. Okay. And then, as much as it's important for us to consider how we feel about writing, I think it's also very important to consider how our learners feel about writing. There are different approaches to writing in different cultures. There are some cultures that highly value writing, and there are others that are more oral oral based so when you think about your learner or your class of learners do you have a picture of how they feel about writing and this is something that you can do with uh, some interview questions you can find out what what the learners affect is towards writing those of you that were in the prior webinar I gave about the writing process I have already thought a bit about the purpose of writing but I found these quotes by um, I'm going to forget her name let me just <laughs> by Joey Hawkins to be very uh, very insightful so the fact that writing can be thought of as the construction and communication of meaning about content that matters that came that comes you know as a very general statement but then she goes on to say, whether that content is personal or academic, writing is a powerful synthesizing experience that allows even forces the thinker writer to make connections among ideas, to sort and develop, and to finally create a coherent chunk of meaning out of a body of ideas and or experiences. What we see in that statement is that writing influences how we think and how we learn and can actually increase our learning and our understanding by, as an end product, creating meaning from all the ideas that we've gathered. And if as teachers, tutors, we are only having our learners do short answer worksheet writing and not composing, we're robbing them of this experience. Okay, maybe robbing them was a little intense. Okay. So what will we be doing today? We're going to consider the College and Career Readiness Writing Anchor Standards because this is what our adult learners aspire to in order to be ready for 21st century workplaces and academic settings. And the research shows that learners who are going to succeed in this age are going to have to have strong reading, writing, speaking and listening skills that are very focused on the ability to navigate complex text, cite evidence, and build knowledge using text and using writing. So we're going to be talking about the use of informational text as the basis of writing tasks, looking at the I do, we do, you do approach, which will be very appropriate to all levels, literacy through uh, high school, and examine how sentence and paragraph frames support learners' writing skill development. And I hope you'll find that fun. So let's start by first addressing the college and career readiness standards and what they are. Uh, they're a set of English language arts and math standards that focus on the critical skills and knowledge required for success in the 21st century in the workplace and in academic settings. And they were developed by a panel. They have anchor standards and level specific standards. 
in developing this uh, set of standards, there was an integration of three shifts of thinking or advances in instruction, and they, re they revolve around complexity, evidence, and knowledge. A very important aspect of, of the standards is that they are not simply anchor standards, which would be the end goal, but they are contain leveled standards which show what students should be able to achieve by the end of a certain level of proficiency. And possibly most importantly, they're not a curriculum. They don't tell us what we have to teach or how we have to teach it. They tell us this is the goal, this is where you want the learner to be. How can you, working with your strengths and knowing the learner's needs, create the best lessons and curriculum along those lines? So if we look a little more closely at the shifts, because I think that's something that you'll want informing your thinking throughout your lesson planning. When students engage with complex text, they're getting something that's worth thinking and writing about. A lot of times we ask learners to write from personal experience, and we know that writing what you know is a very useful way to compose, and it, it, it can be very motivating. But in some cases, learners don't have the they don't have the shared experience, or we have to build a lot of schema in order to get them to be able to write about a particular type of experience. When they write from text, when they look at a text and they're using that text as the basis for their expository writing, or their argument, or their justification, they are working on something that everyone in the classroom has equal access to, or certainly in the tutorial session that you and the learner can come to a, a, an understanding of. When they extract and employ evidence from that text, they're supporting their claims in a way that they're going to be asked to do in a post-secondary educational setting or in the workplace. If I want to propose an idea to my boss, I need to be able to, to back that up with evidence. If I want to cite a situation that's unsafe, I have to be able to explain why it's unsafe and what rules it's breaking. And so you know, this, this textual evidence is actually very practical to adult lives. And last but certainly not least is the concept, uh, the shift towards building knowledge. We want learners to be reading cross-disciplinary materials. We want them to be using their writing and their reading and their speaking and listening in class to build their knowledge because that, again, gives them something worth thinking and writing about. So in a nutshell, the standards are relevant because they are connected directly to adult needs in post-secondary and workplace settings. They provide for necessary skill development. What we know, based on the research, is needed for our adult learners. And we'll be looking specifically at the standards, but I'm just giving you the global picture now. And because they're set up in a way with a level, the standards are leveled, there's a progression and an integration of skills. So even though you're working on a writing standard, you're also looking at the reading and the speaking and listening and the language development that goes along with that. So there are five strands, and we're just going to focus on the writing strand today, but I wanted you to know about the, the strands. So uh, reading has 10 anchor standards, and writing has nine, and speaking and listening also nine and language six. And there's a reading foundation standard. It's very important to the literacy and beginning low ESOL teachers that you'll want to take a look at. Just so you know, Nicole will be sending out an email with a link that will give you the PDF of the standards, this PowerPoint uh, in a PDF form with clickable links, and also a few other resources that I think will be of use for you as you explore this concept. I think it's important to understand the organization of the, uh, I just want to check and make sure I have no questions. Let me, give me just a sec. Okay, I see that I have a few questions, so I'll stop right after this and check, take a look at the questions. Um, I, w I think it's important to understand the organization of the standards so that, that when you're looking at this document, you have a clear idea of what you're looking at. It, every standard begins with an anchor standard, which is the overarching standard that 
what learners are expected to be able to do in this particular area by the end of high school. And so the Common Core standards work for K through 12. The College and Career Readiness standards are for adult learners. But the understanding is that if certain things had to be done by high school in K through 12, they certainly would still have to be done by the end of our high school program. So the standards do correlate, uh, but they have been streamlined so that we're not looking at all of the standards that are part of Common Core. We're looking at some very specific standards. And then within each anchor standard, we have level-specific standards. And I'll show you exactly what those are. OK, it looks like <laughs> we've got some different answers about the types of programs. That we have some different questions about the types of programs. And I think that we'll, we'll answer some of those as we go forward. So, one thing you'll want to think about is when I'm talking about an A level or a B level, what does that correlate to? In CASAS has done a correlation. The Office of Career Technical and Adult Education has not for ESOL. But CASAS has. So the OCTA has done that first column, correlating the CCR groups to the ABE levels. So if you know what your ABE level is, you can take a look over to the left and you'll see whether you're an A, B, C, D, or E level specific standard when you're looking at the standard document. If you're ESOL, and because CASAS is out of California, they made it ESL. If you're ESOL, you can look and see what, how CASAS is correlated. So it's important to note that the A level is three levels of ESOL. It goes from beginning literacy through beginning high. So when you're looking at a level-specific standard, you have to think of that standard as even becoming more broken down for the different levels within. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But primarily, we're looking at the B through E levels today. OK, let's see if I can make this go back a step. There we go. These are the level standards. This is what they look like. Tiny, huh? So I'm not going to make you read this tiny little writing. This is pretty visually clear, however, that there is a progression. So if you're looking at that A band, you see that there's a lot less, a, a lot less text in that A band than there is in that E band. So you can see that the learners are gradually progressing to a higher and higher level of proficiency in the standard. And here's a look at this standard. This is College and Career Readiness Anchor Standard 2 for writing. And in this standard, by the end of high school, the learners would be, adult high school, the learners would be able to write informative and explanatory text to examine and convey complex ideas and information clearly and accurately through the effective selection, organization, and analysis of content. So that's a big order. But it's exactly what's needed if I'm going to operate successfully in a state college or if I'm going to go into a career training program, I need to be able to do this. But what about the A level? Well, here's how appropriate it is for a beginning high student by the end of beginning high or a beginning ABE student should be able to write an explanatory text where they name a topic supply some facts about a topic, and provide some sense of closure. This is something we could have our learners be able to do. This is not unachievable for our levels. It gets a little more intense by the time we get into intermediate low or ABEB. That now we're talking about introducing, developing a topic, using linking words, and providing a concluding statement. There's still a connection to what happened in A, but now let's take a look at C, which has the same concepts, introducing the topic, developing linking ideas. Now we're adding using precise language and providing a concluding statement that is related to the information presented. So as you can see, the language for the standards, the level-specific standards, progresses with the level of proficiency of the learner. And it gives a, a, a very clear connection to the prior level and the level that they're going towards. I'm not even going to bother reading D to you, and I didn't put E in because it's just too much text. But it, you can see visually that we're building skills and building more and more competency in the writing standard. 
So let's get to the point. What are these standards and how do they affect us as instructors and tutors? These are the standards as they're written, the anchor standards as they're written. I thought it might be more useful if we looked at them with just a, a slightly more streamlined view. So for the first one, what we're really doing is focusing on reasoning and evidence to support claims, making arguments. In the anchor standard, it's written this way, for the level specific standard, there is no requirement that someone at a beginning literacy ABE level or a beginning through beginning high ESOL level would be able to work on this. This is, uh, starts with intermediate low. This one, however, as you saw, focusing on the selection, organization, and analysis of content for expository text, this one does have uh, an A level. So it would give us a place to, to, to get a foothold for our, for our beginning level students. We could start working with that. The third anchor standard is about narratives. And this has the learner focusing on narrative technique, details, and structure of events. Now I want you to think about as we're going through this, what do you do with your learners that is already aimed towards these types of standards? The fourth one is really about matching the writing to the task, the purpose, and the audience. Writing clearly and connecting the writing to the task, the purpose, and the audience. And five is really focusing on the writing process. Now, one of the great things about these standards is that they do integrate very well together. So you could be working on helping your learners write a, a paragraph where they have a main idea and a few key details and a conclusion, and you're doing the writing process in order to get them there. So it's not that these stand in isolation, they very often uh, integrate. Oops. And the, oops, I have a little trouble with my advance, sorry everybody. Uh, the last one on this page, which is Six, writing anchor six, is to focus on digital literacy skills and writing. Being able to do, use word processing, to do your editing, being able to publish your writing using digital literacy. And of course, again, just like the writing process, this could be applied to any of the writing tasks that are supporting the other standards. There are three more standards, the nine writing standards I spoke of. This one I think is really interesting because in my experience in going around this, the, the U.S., I haven't seen that we're giving our learners a lot of work with research. And now that we have internet, even though our learners may not yet have complete access, we have in many cases access and we can provide multiple sources for learners to look at um, in order to compare and synthesize. Conducting effective research short and sustained is a very important part of career training and academic settings. So this is something that we can work on with our lower level learners. We can work together and then we can start releasing responsibility with our higher level learners so they're doing this on their own with some guidelines. Sorry. This then goes right to that if you're gathering multiple sources then you're going to have to know how to summarize and paraphrase and cite those sources without plagiarizing. And the last standard is the ability to make connections between ideas in your writing. And of course that's a very key concept that we're able to now you know, do this research, summarize, paraphrase, and cite, but in the higher purpose of synthesizing and coming up with ideas that are a connection between the different ideas that we have collected or read about. So what are you already doing with your learners? Take a look at these and see if you can identify aspects of your, write, of your work with writing with your learners. Why don't you just take, um, if you have a pencil or pen handy, just take a moment and jot down one thing that you're not doing that you think would be something you might want to try with your learner. A 
And remember, these are very broad brush strokes. Once you get into the college and career readiness standards and you look at your level specific standard, you're going to have a very clear idea of what's appropriate to your level. But just in a general way, an awareness. And remember that for beginning literacy, beginning low learners, we can work from visuals, we can do language experience stories, um, but we can also provide short quotations and, and read those quotations and then discuss and then write a short summary or a, a, even a sentence that says what that quotation means. I mean, there's, there's a lot that we can do with our learners, um, helping them to read deeply and then process what they read. I just want to make sure I don't have any questions. Okay, looks good. So what do your learners write when they're with you? This is something that I think we need to consider as well. You know, are they doing sentence completion and closed paragraphs? Are they doing brief personal narratives, short notes and messages, business emails? Just Take a look at this list, and this is a pretty limited list. If you, okay, I, I was trying to figure out how I could get a response from you on this. Um, would you raise your hand if you are doing at least half of these types of writing tasks with your learners? And Nicole showed you how to raise your hand to show me that. Nicole, where do I look to see the response? Um, it should be under the attendees' names. Okay, great. You see that? Yes, I do. Okay, perfect. I'm gonna... So I'm looking to see how many of you are indicating that you do at least half of these. And that's a good sign. It looks like about 50% of you are doing at least half. That's really nice synchronicity with the world. <laughs> Those of you that are not touching on these, I would like you to, you'll get a copy of this handout of this PowerPoint, but when you do, I'd like you to, to consider at least two or three of these, introducing these into your tutorial or your class sessions because these are the types of uh, writing tasks that are pretty relevant to what our learners are doing outside the classroom and what they'll need to do in their, work, in their workplace settings eventually, even if they're not in that setting now. What the research has shown, and uh, Perrin and Graham are the two researchers that have done a lot of work on this, is that writing holds learners back from advancing at work. Uh, definitely writing skills are looked at for salaried positions. When you think about the type of writing that learners will do in the workplace and academic settings, you know, this comes to mind. You know, they're going to be doing inventories and they're going to be writing reports and they're going to be writing essays and taking notes, hopefully effective notes that will help them either study for um, assessments or be the, the uh, basis for the additional writing. They're going to have to write emails with the appropriate register. Uh, it's very important. A lot of our learners have writing skills, especially our native speakers. They may have writing skills that they've just completely transferred their oral language over to their written language, and that is not going to work for them in terms of the workplace and academic settings. They're going to need to up the register, professionalize their writing. And we need to think about what they'll be writing about. So when you're sitting with your learner or in your classes, we need to know what are the career goals, what are the academic goals of our learners, and then from there we can start to extrapolate what type of writing will they be doing, what will they be thinking about, um, sorry, not what will they be thinking about, but what will they be writing about and thinking about, obviously, uh, when they're in their career training class or when they're in their um, college, state college class or their university class. Or, and if we want to go completely off the workplace academic side of things, 
what do they need to write about in their community? What kinds of information do they need to tell a doctor in a, in a narrative paragraph about uh, at the bottom of their health care form? What do they need to write to their child's uh, administrator or teacher? So these are all things that we need to be aware of when we're planning our writing uh, lessons. One of the things that we know learners will have to do is they will have to be able to write from text. They'll have to be able to look at a piece of text and then write about it in some manner. And one of the, th the standards highly encourages is the use of rich informational text and media as the basis for writing. Now you see that in this little collection here I've got something from the history, uh, the PBS, I think this is PBS, might be the History Channel's website. Um, I've got a, a text about the girls from uh, Atomic City. I've got a newspaper article on putting a woman on the face of the $20 bill. And I have a TED Talk. All of these would qualify as informational text. S granted, it's media, but it's also uh, it has the same quality of text in that there's an oral passage that the learner will be evaluating and, and uh, diving deeply into to get content. It's not that literary works are not valued. They're very much valued, and there's tremendous um, higher level thinking that comes out of looking at literary pieces. But we have a tendency in our field to not value the informational text as much as it needs to be valued. Uh, males lag behind uh, women in reading tremendously, and one of the re reasons they found, the researchers found, is that they really prefer informational text. Our learners in K-12 schools are four years behind uh, what they, where they need to be to be able to succeed in college-level classes. And that would be true for career training classes as well. So we need to help our adult learners familiarize themselves with the type of texts, 90% of the texts they're going to experience in post-secondary education and in the workplace are informational. So we want to layer the literary in there, but we want to make sure that they're getting a rich collection of informational text to build their knowledge and also to allow them to more easily cite evidence when they are making their arguments or their claims about uh, an opinion. So that said, how do we help our learners when we have a really limited time frame? The learners in our class have varied levels of proficiency, or perhaps our single learner in a tutorial session has very strong oral skills but very weak reading and writing skills. And what do we do when we have limited access to 21st century technology? I mean, you know, the, the push is towards having digital literacy. We want everyone to have digital literacy, but the reality is not everyone has access. Or when we want to have access, we maybe don't. The first step is to link reading and writing. And that's why it's lovely that the Florida Literacy Coalition is the sponsor of this webinar, because literacy involves reading and writing. And if, we, if our learners write about what they read, they already have a foundation for their writing. It's not a matter of them having to stretch their imagination initially. They've got a great model, and they've got the evidence to write from. When they go back into the text for evidence to support their ideas, they strengthen not only their writing skills, but their reading skills as well. You want to also link listening, speaking, and writing. When the learners get additional exposure to the content and big ideas that they're reading about, they'll write by that they'll they'll write more effectively. And one of the ways we can do that is having them listen to mini lectures related to what they read or are going to read. You can do it as a pre-reading asking them text-dependent questions that have them process the content orally and orally before they write. So essentially, this is just like the writing process concept we talked about in the prior webinar and that we're going to revisit a little bit here. We need to do pre-writing 
And if we think of the reading that we do and the listening and speaking discussion of the reading ideas as pre-writing, we're actually condensing the time on the writing lesson because we're doing two, we're integrating two key uh, skill areas at the same time. We also want to make sure that we help learners look at the organization of text they're reading because that has a huge impact on their ability to write in an organized way that's acknowledged by US writers. I, I'm sure a lot of you have uh, English language learners and in many cases English language learners come from cultures where writing is done differently. Uh, Spanish writing tends to be more flowery. Uh, Arabic writing tends to be more circuitous. So there are all these cross-cultural boundaries to writing in a concise US-based manner that our learners don't have exposure to. So if we provide the text and then say, let's look at the way that the author has laid out these ideas, we're giving the learner support for his or her own writing and his, own, his or her own organization. So these are two guys that you can probably tell are twins. Um, I am a complete fan of News ELA. Uh, it's newsela.org, and the, the link is actually in this PowerPoint, but it's also in what you're being sent. And if you don't know about newsela.org, it's, uh, uh, it's actually called Newsella. That's what they, I, I, do, I stress the ELA part, but I found out that they call themselves Newsella. They take newspaper uh, articles from all over the U.S., and they categorize them under uh, world, health, science, uh, war and peace, kids, because it's, it, it, it started as a K-12 site, and I think arts and, and uh, education. And those, within those different topics, they provide very recent news articles, and they lexile them so that you get the original article, but if you want, you can get a fourth grade level of the text. So, for example, this story came out uh, last week, and it, the idea is that, that uh, they're looking at cognition in space. So the, one of the twins is going to the um, space center, no, space station, and the other twin is staying home, and they're going to study the two astronauts' cognition, one in, um, on Earth and one in space, because there's uh, an issue called space fogginess that affects people in space and they want to study more about it. And because these two guys have brains that are similar, they're able to do these tests and they'll be able to get a lot of information. So high interest stuff, really building knowledge. The article uh, is here and then I would have the students, I'm going to try to show you a little bit what I would do. Let's see if I can get my, okay, be aware I'm going to ask you to, um, Nicole, I'm going to ask you to delete the marker after I do it. But I can have students, I can ask the students to focus on where the author places key ideas. So uh, I think that I'm looking at this, the astronaut Scott Kelly is about to take off for the International Space Station, and if he's like some space travelers, he may temporarily feel a bit foggy or disoriented. Hmm. Okay, so I think that space travelers uh, being disoriented in orbit is an, is an important idea. And let's see, uh, scientists have not had much luck measuring this subtle effect with standard cognitive tests. Okay, the group of University of Pennsylvania researchers, they're going to compare Kelly in space and his identical twin, Mark. So what, I, what I'm able to do with the learners is I'm able to show, in a tutorial this is really easy because we're sitting together, I'm able to show how I see the main ideas and key details as I'm reading. And I can also say, you know, well, let's look at the way that it's um, set up. He didn't start off with the main idea. He just started off with something to grab my attention. The astronaut Scott Kelly is about to take off for the International Space Station. Ooh. I want to read more about that. I like space. So if I, if I work with my learner very specifically, digging deeply into the reading and how it's organized, I'm setting up how he or she may be better able to write in a similar fashion when they're 
reporting on a an event. Now, in, the other thing that I want to be able to do is have learners focus on academic language that creates connections. So, in this case, um, such topics as um, let's see, will be compared with. So I can start looking for uh, collocations or transitions that are in this, uh, in this text and, and have the learner work with me on those and then perhaps be able to make use of them in his or her own writing. Okay, Nicole, will you go ahead and delete my, my messiness? Terrific, thank you. And then I think I have to turn it off so I don't keep doing it. Okay. Did you maybe take my power away? Hi, let me go ahead and redo it for you. There you Thank go. Thank you. Fine. Hold on one second. Nicole is a little power mad, everyone, just so you know. I don't blame her. If I had the ability to take control, I would do it too. Okay, you want, oh, there we go. One of the things I mentioned to you about uh, Newzella is that it, it comes in different levels. So this is the 12th grade version, and this is the 4th grade version. So there are ways that we can work with the same text, and this is really helpful if you're in a multi-level class, you can work with the same text concepts but at different levels of uh, language ability and reading skill. When I talked about asking those text-dependent questions, we really have to think about text-dependent questions because we want the learner to, sure, find the main ideas and find the key details, but we also want to stretch the idea within the text and make sure that the learner can can infer and do some of the more higher level thinking tasks through the question. So, you know, I could have the learner do that first one that's very dependent on, uh, on the text. The second one is really a key detail. You know, according to the article, how will scientists evaluate Scott's thinking in space? But the third one is really an inference, and, and you didn't see this part, but in the, in the article it talks about the fact that the trip to the space station is rather a short trip into space, but we're looking at a trip to Mars, and so understanding whether the astronaut is going to be cognitively sound in making that longer trip is a pretty important uh, consideration. So this is the type of thing that we can talk about with our learners. Now, this is high-level language. I'm not saying it's not high-level language, but there are only three questions here, and we can really work with the learners on these questions, make sure they understand the questions, and then use the text to help answer them. And the response to these questions could be in writing, but that's, it's not really about composing at this point. It's really about answering a question and perhaps as accurately or as fluently as possible. What we really want to get to is having the learner compose. So in order to have someone compose a, a summary or a view, they have to be able to organize the ideas. And I'm sure a lot of you have wor worked with graphic organizers. Why don't you give me a little hands up if you've worked with graphic organizers with your learners before? I can see that Amanda and Angel and Betty have. This is where I do my Miss Mary romper room. <laughs> it looks like quite a number of you have worked with graphic organizers. So we can do it two ways. We can work with the graphic organizer with the text, or we can work with the graphic organizer with the learner's ideas about what they're going to present with the text. So in this case, I, I want the learner, let's say, to write about um, you know, a, a problem in space and one of the problems in space travel and, and how science is, is working to solve it. Okay, so they're going to write this nonfiction piece. And so in order to do that, they're going to break down this article. Uh, and I chose these areas, the, you know, the problem, the subjects, the study. And then, of course, the solution is not yet known. So this is where the learner's going to have an opportunity to 
to pose what he thinks may or may not happen as part of this experiment. There are a number of graphic organizers you can make use of. Outline and chain events, cause effect, concept map, procon. They all have to go back to, though, what is the purpose of the writing? So, you know, if we're writing something that has a sequential narrative, then an outline or a chain of events graphic organizer is going to be what we'll, we would want the student to use. If we're doing a comparison or um, contrast, then probably a pro-con or a ven or even a cause-effect graphic organizer would be of use. We we'll have to think about the tool matching the task very important for our learners and for us when we're developing the lesson. I, I don't know if you know about uh, the plus minus interesting. This is a very uh, creative way to prompt writing, and it comes from Edward de Bono's Six Hats. But the idea is that there's a plus column, a minus column, and an interesting column. And the prompt is, what's good, bad, or interesting about X? So it could be, you know, what's good, bad, or interesting about being foggy during uh, the initial part of space, of space travel. I can think that the good thing would be that I wouldn't be freaked out that I was so far from home. Okay, the minus might be that I can't manage the controls. And the interesting might be that I would have a whole different perspective uh, when I'm foggy of what Earth looks like from space. Okay, that's just off the top of my head, but the plus minus interesting chart does prompt a lot of creative thought. So remember, if we're, if we're following the process where we are, reading is influencing writing, we want to make sure that we verify the learner's understanding of the text, we want to deepen their comprehension with higher level questions, we want to determine the purpose for writing about the information. Are we going to uh, are we writing to entertain? Are we writing to inform? Are we writing to prove that we understand? Uh, are we writing to uh, justify an argument? We have to have that awareness, and the learner does too, obviously. We want to share a model of the type of writing that learners will produce, and we'll look at that in a second. We want to ask questions about the organization of the model, and we want to have learners use graphic organizers as planning tools. And we have to remember that writing is a process. So we're going to start with generating ideas, which could come from the reading. We're going to organize those ideas, which could be helped by the reading. We're going to do some drafting and editing, uh, our own editing, and then we'll get feedback and do additional editing and revising. Then we might get additional feedback, this time from um, a, on, on terms of a final view by the teacher. and then we finalize it and we could do that, we could finalize as a group or we could finalize individually. Notice that the feedback and the revision as well as the revision, you can see that this, this is a back and forth process, it isn't necessarily uh, linear. And to make this process work very effectively with our learners, it's very helpful to do the I do, we do, you do process. This is a, an approach to teaching that is a gradual relinquishing of responsibility, but it also provides our learners with direct instruction, which we tend not to provide, and our learners really need it when it comes to how to read a text deeply, how to write an effective summary. These are things that we have to teach if the learner doesn't have that uh, education, that prior education uh, from his or her country or in the U.S. So in the I do, the teacher models the drafting process. You make errors, you add language, you write aloud. You are essentially speaking as you're writing to show the learners your process. You engage the learner authentically in the process. So you see in this image, I'm thinking to myself, you know, I want to say that the brains are the same, but I, it's not really same. That's not the word I want. And the learner comes up with similar to help me out because, of course, we both read the same reading. And then I read my, my writing aloud for feedback, edits, and revision. So I'm essentially demonstrating the writing for the learner. Maybe this happens with a paragraph summary of the text, the first paragraph we do together. I'm sorry, I do. 
the second paragraph, maybe we do together. And in this case, I'm acting more as a scribe. I'm prompting. I'm coaching. And I'll ask lang uh, questions to check the language. I, you know, uh, you're saying this here. Is that the word we want? Um, let's see. There's a subject here and a description here, but I don't see anything that connects them. You know, these are the types of things that I can, I can be working with the learner as we're writing this together. And I want to make sure that the learner is using the appropriate register. So I can take his casual register and up it to a more professional register. And then we edit together. Another way to handle the we do is to have, if you have a class, you have the learners collaborate on the writing together. Collaborating meaning together, so there's a little redundancy there. But they collaborate and then you coach in the same way, but you're going around from group to group. And finally, we get to where the learner is working on writing him or herself. So this is, they're working independently, and they're following the stages of the process. This is a very stepped out. So if I had, you know, tutorial sessions, I would probably try to do the I do and the we do in the first session, and then in the second session, do a we do and you do, so that I'm not leaving, casting the learner adrift when he comes in or she comes in for that session. I'm giving them a little background, but then I'm, I'm throwing him into the pool and giving him that time to write. We want to make sure that we're also scaffolding and supporting. So for those of you that are, are uh, teaching beginning ESL learners or beginning ABE learners, we need to make sure that, that we're providing the scaffolds that support their writing and that they can then concentrate on the content and build the skills for the accuracy by having the model for the accuracy there. So always be sure you, want, you know what you want the learners to do by the end of the lesson. as I've uh, detailed here. And don't forget the purpose of the writing. When you're setting up these scaffolds, remember that you're thinking about what is it that the learner is going to have by the end of that lesson, and is it going to do what, it, what the writing should do. For example, got a little delay. Here's um, a way to use sentence frames that will help the learners practice their academic register. And you have these when you, you know, you'll get a copy of these. But also I asked Dr. Kate Kinsella, who is the queen of sentence and paragraph frames, uh, if I could send you a PDF of her institute uh, materials. And she said yes, as long as you were sure you knew it was hers. And, and it, her name's all over it. So you'll be getting a copy of that and with lots and lots of examples of, of these types of frames. But I wanted to show you this. So it's not cheating to use this. This is the language that the learners are going to need. And so by giving them these, these uh, sentence frames, they can start building the habit of this language. Here's another example for summaries. Notice that beneath the blank, I'm giving options so that the learner, it sh this shouldn't be a write by numbers activity. This is about providing the skeleton, but the student still has to provide the, the still has to flesh out the, the writing. And I just love this. This, to me, is such a great tool for a student because it shows you exactly how to put together a citation and for, for the learner so that they know that the first time they mention the author, they have to use the full name. The second time they mention the author, they have to use the last name. And after that, they can, they can put in uh, a descriptive word that means the author. And then you've got all those great verbs. And this is a great opportunity to, dis to discriminate between point out versus state. What's the connotation? And that, we're talking about higher level um, uh, instruction at this point, but it's still really an important point. And at the lower level, we don't have to give as many options. 
These two I'm going to skip over because they're in the, the handout and we have a little animation glitch. But one of the things that I do when I'm going to come up with a, uh, a scaffold is I write a letter first or I write a summary first and then I blank out the parts that I know the student could fill in with original content. So I look for uh, collocations, I look for academic transitions, I look for general phrases that would just be generic from situation to situation. So in this case, this is a, a, a piece of correspondence or a justification. So paragraph frames support our learners in these ways. Oops, went too quickly. They provide the accurate structure, they build academic language, they provide the building blocks or patterns that we can expand upon. You can do a paragraph frame and then have the learner write subsequent paragraphs without as much framing. And they also help the learner focus on the key content that he or she is trying to convey. And of course, just as you would do in any good scaffolding, you pull that scaffolding off little by little over the course of the semester or the time that you're working with the student. So that brings us right to 11, uh, my time, to yours. Um, I haven't seen any questions come in. Oop. Can you please give suggestions on how to increase the students registered? So I, I hope that, Leah, that you've seen that there is a way to do that with uh, Kate Kinsella's structured frames. And Susan, uh, maybe, maybe Newzella is a dot com. I apologize. You, you'll see it on the, uh, the handout, Susan. I don't see any other questions coming in. So why don't I leave you with this frame? Oh, wait, these are the, so it looks like I did, Newzella.org, again, uh, please check .com in case I've got it wrong, everybody. I apologize. But these will all come to you through uh, an email with Nicole. This will be on the, the PDF, and you'll be able to click right from there. So actually, even if I've typed it wrong, it is, it is linked to the correct link. And Nicole, I'm trying to get to the last uh, slide, but I'm, oh, there we go. And so here is my uh, scaffolded uh, paragraph frame. Please fill it in appropriately. And I, I really do hope that you're able to take away uh, some important concepts from this webinar, but I know it's, it's, we move pretty quickly. So Nicole, would you be willing to put up the poll? Sure, yeah. We have one last poll for you, and I'll go ahead and pull that up right now. And then this poll, I'm looking to see what takeaways you have. Hold on one second. Okay. And it looks like you can only select one, everybody. But if you want to write another in the question pod, feel free. I'm sure that Nicole and Greg would be happy to see what other takeaways you've got, your, your, you have. And also, what questions? Uh, we will also be sending out a survey to everyone. Um, if you've done one of our webinars before, you know that um, we send a follow-up email um, with all your handouts, and um, we'll, send you, we'll link a survey as well in that email. All right, I think we'll go ahead and close this poll out. I'm delighted that you were inspired to do more writing. And I do hope that those of you that, that uh, are interested in sentence or paragraph frames will have the time to look through Dr. Kinsella's material because it's, uh, it's very detailed and it's something that's really worth taking the time to look at. And with that, thank you so much. 
Yeah, thank you everyone for joining today. Um, like I said a few seconds ago, we'll be sending out a thank you email to everyone. Um, let me just make sure there aren't any questions for me in here. I don't think there are. Um, and, and if you're looking for the uh, recording of this, it will be on our YouTube channel. Okay, and I think that's it. Have a nice afternoon, everyone. Uh, Nicole, we, yeah. Nicole, we have I'm one sorry. question that I should answer. Oh, okay. okay. That's okay. Krista's question about where can I find a chart that compares, uh, and that's, that's uh, that you would find on Pearson Maturity or on the CASAS website. All right. If there are any more questions, we'll go ahead and take them right now. Any last-minute questions? Okay. Does it, um, let's see. Yeah, the, the uh, handouts will be sent automatically um, through your email addresses um, along with the other stuff. Let's see. Doesn't look like we're ha we have any more questions. All right. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, have a great afternoon.